Welcome again to our online Bible study that we call God's Message to the Church. We've been looking at discipleship. That's the title of the whole lessons that we've been uh, studying for the last how many months. I think it goes back to, all the way to the first of the year. But we've been looking at the building blocks of discipleship and how discipleship is not something that is instantaneous. It is something that takes time and it takes development, I guess is the best word to say. Because Jesus said that we're to go and make disciples. And so it is a process that we go through to develop ourselves as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have now come to the internal structure and we've been looking at the Beatitudes. There are eight of these and we've been looking, we're now looking at number six. Where it says, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. And as we were looking last time, we were saying that the Apostle Paul has put a link between the pure in heart with love. If you look on the right hand side, in, on, this is showing 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. He said, the purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love. And he says that love comes from, number one, a pure heart, number two, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. And so we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 when the Apostle Paul is describing what is love. And again, we said it's not an emotion, it's not a feeling that we have. It is those internal qualities such as patience. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not delight in evil. It rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. And it never fails. <clears throat> so we said this is the expression of love. And you could put God in the place of love. You could say God is patient. God is kind. And then you can put your name and say, I am patient, I am kind, I do not envy, etc. And that's just a measuring stick to see if love truly exists inside of our hearts. But he says, but Paul's goal, his purpose for instruction is that we would all be filled with love that comes from a pure heart. <clears throat> so love has to come out of a pure heart. If you don't have a pure heart, how can you love? So you see that as you look around you at, at different people and you're saying, well, does this person really love? Do they really have a pure heart? And we said last time when we left off that we would look at the story of Joseph because I think this is a classic example of someone with a pure heart. Now, Joseph, in Genesis chapter 39, he is a teenager. As a teenager, as 17 years old, his brothers, because Joseph had big dreams for his life and he kept telling his brothers about this and also the fact that Joseph <clears throat> was the favorite son of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons and 
Joseph was next to the baby and he was or he was uh, he was the the son of his favorite wife Rachel let me put it that way and Jacob had given him a coat of many colors so he was quote unquote special with his father and it made his brothers or his half brothers envious of him they were jealous of him even to the point that they hated him and first they wanted to kill him but then they said no let's don't do that let's make some money off of him and so they sold him as a slave and sent him off with some merchants who were headed towards Egypt so we know that Jake, Joseph left the promised land and was taken down into Egypt. And he ends up in the home of Potiphar, who is one of Pharaoh's officials, who happens to be the captain of the guard. And Potiphar had bought Joseph from some Ishmaelite merchants. But notice verse 2, it said, The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. Think about that. Here he was sold as a slave into Egypt. He was without a family. He was all by himself. And he was in a, a strange land, totally foreign to him. But it says the Lord was with him and that he prospered even if he was sold as a slave. Notice it said, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Well, think about this. When Joseph was, was back home, he lived in a tent. He was a camper, if you will. I mean, a rough type of camper. To live, to live in a tent. And he was used to taking care of animals. So he was a, you know, he was used to the great outdoors. And he was used to a, a very, it wasn't a luxurious type of life. But now he's living in the house of his master. Hey, that's an upgrade, if you will. You say, well, he's a slave. Yeah, but I think about some of the plantations in the south, uh, years ago, back in the 1800s, and some of those uh, plantation owners had slaves that they bought, but those that took care of the house, the butlers and the ones that worked in the kitchen and the maids and so forth, they had, I mean, they were living in a, in a mansion. And so it wasn't all bad, you know, as long as they had a good master. Being in slavery is not necessarily the worst thing that there could be. So he was living in the house of his Egyptian master. But notice verse 3, when his master saw that the Lord was with him. The Lord was with Joseph. His, even his own master realized this. And then it goes on and says, And that the Lord gave Joseph success in everything he did. So three times it's, it's saying that God is prospering Joseph, the Lord is with Joseph, and that it's the Lord who's given him success in everything that he puts his hand to. So he found favor in Potiphar's eyes, and he became his attend attendant. In fact, Potiphar put him in charge of his entire household. Everything that he owned, he put under the care. He entrusted it to Joseph. So, wow, Joseph was promoted. He was given a good job. <clears throat> so he's got a good job. Yes, he's a slave. Yes, he was bought. Yes, he doesn't have any family. But look how God is even using these circumstances in his life. But, we get to verse 7. 
And it says, and it came about after these events. After Joseph is bought, after Potiphar recognizes that the Lord is with Joseph, that he's prospering, that he, is, he has integrity, he feels confident in him, he trusts Joseph. But here is Potiphar's wife, and it said that she looked with desire at Joseph. Joseph is 17 years old. We don't know how old Potiphar's wife was, but she looked with desire. He was a, a very handsome young man. And so she's trying to seduce him. But verse 8, he refused. And he said, my master has trusted me. He's put everything that he has under my charge. There's no one here that's greater in this house, as far as his servants is concerned, than I am. And he has not withheld anything from me except you because you're, you're his wife. And then notice the last sentence here. How then could I do this great evil and sin who against God? He didn't say that I would sin against Potiphar. He said, I, I can't do this and sin against God. So here is Joseph recognizing that if he were to do this, that this would be wrong. How did he know this? How did he know that this would be sinning against God? Because there wasn't a Bible in those days. Moses comes along hundreds of years later. And then we have the Ten Commandments and the laws and the statutes, etc. So this is hundreds of years before there is even a Bible. But Joseph recognizes that to do this, to succumb to Potiphar's wife's seduction, that it would be wrong and that he would be sinning against God. So, again... Verse 10, we'll skip verse 9 because we looked at it. And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he wouldn't listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. So it wasn't a one-time deal with her. She was trying to wear Joseph down. If he, if he would not accept her invitation the first time, that didn't deter her. Day after day after day, she was tempting Joseph. But one day, in verse 11 it says, he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house. And that's when she caught him by his garments, and she said, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand, and fled, and got out of Dodge. He got out of that house. Now, here... She didn't want any witnesses. Maybe she was afraid that the reason that he didn't want to do this is that they would get caught. And that maybe that's why Joseph would not accept her invitation. So he, she made sure that all the men of the house were out of the house at that time. But he said no. And he ran. He ran. He didn't care. He was getting out of there. You know, I know that today there's a real struggle with pornography, especially among Christian men. The statistics show that, you know, it's so readily accessible now. And we know that there's a great temptation. There is a draw. There is a pull there. But here, uh, I'm going to show you a short clip. This is Sean Boltz, B-O-L-Z, Sean Boltz. And he is talking about when he was 11 years old. Now he talks real fast, and, uh, and the, sound, the sound quality is not too good, but I hope you get the gist of this, that he and some friends of his 
are walking along a path and they run across some pornography. So here's what he had to say about it. Oh, I don't know what happens, but this happens for a lot of guys. When I was 11 years old, I, I was walking down a path and with some friends with kind of a pornographic magazine. I didn't even know there was such a thing. I was like the most innocent kid. I was like in shock looking at the pictures going, this exists. Like I was just in, I was, my world was blown, you know? And I go to my dad, and I, I, I go straight home, and my dad's home early. I'm like, Dad, I just want to work on the magazine. I don't know why I didn't even call that. I was like, it's all the magazine of naked people. My friends and I were looking at it, I was crazy. I, Did you know this exists? And he's like, ah, oh, and we're both kind of laughing and also sad at the same time, really sad. Like, he's like, yeah, son. And, and, and I just had no sexual waking at all. I was like, shocked. You know, just like, how in the world does this happen, you know? And he goes, well, how did you feel when you looked at it? I was like, scared and excited. I was like, Dad, have you ever seen this? He goes, yeah, unfortunately I have. And he, he said, you know, uh, the, those women that are in that magazine with those men, can you imagine if that was your sister or your mom? And I said, no. I think it was, well, it's someone's sister and it's someone's mom. It's someone's daughter. He goes, how would you feel if someone looked at your mom or your sister like that? I was like, I would kill them. I was 11. And he said, well, you need to protect those women because they don't know how to value themselves the way that you're feeling the value of them right now. And I said, the reason why I don't look at these magazines anymore is because when I became a Christian, I began to protect my connection with your mom at all costs because we had years together, and every time I looked away from those years at something else, it violated that connection. We were no longer connected. And so I want to, I want to challenge your son to find that place of connection and protect it with women. I don't remember it was done in me. I never had like a pornographic struggle because of that. Because my dad was an example that said, protect connection at all costs. So what's true in my life, when we got married four years ago, I didn't come into it with a, a bunch of baggage, thank God. And there's no condemnation for anybody who doesn't have a walk that's there in that area. But there's a place inside you that when you understand that character is protecting connection, but the connection is the only thing that we have to protect at all costs, it helps to dismantle a performance issue that's on your life. And if you come to the prophetic. So I just thought that was interesting that here was, uh, here he was as 11 years old, or 11 years old, and he and his friend came across the pornographic um, magazine, and he was seeing these naked women. And, you know, he, his dad, who was in the Air Force, he knew that he had come home, he was home early, so he runs home and he talks to his dad about it. And so his dad has said, well, how would you feel if that was your mom or your sister? And he says, I wouldn't like it at all. I wouldn't, you know, and he says, what would you do if, if you knew that men were uh, watching them or looking at them the way that you were? And he says, I'd kill them, <laughs> you know. And so his dad emphasized to him the fact that he was to protect these women because they really do not value themselves like he values them, like God values them. You know, I don't put all of the blame on men for getting involved in pornography because I'm saying why do women submit themselves to do this? To put them, to expose themselves <clears throat> to all types of men. You know, why would they do that? unless they didn't value themselves, that they didn't feel validated as a person, as a human being, that they thought that the only thing that could attract other people is their sexuality. But there's, you know, we are more than just body parts. We are human beings made in the image and likeness of God. And for those that want to um, expose themselves in this way, there is a, there's a very internal issue there. I was working at Dick, Dick Brooks Honda in Greer, South Carolina. Uh, and one day there was a, a woman, and I was not close to her, I really couldn't see uh, too too good, too well, uh, what she looked like or anything, but I just knew the reaction of the guys. 
and I knew that she was scantily dressed. Uh, I think short shorts and a top that was exposing her body parts. And uh, when she went, when she left the showroom, all the guys gathered around the sales desk, and they were laughing and cutting up. And and later, one of the sales guys who was a believer, he came to me and he says, why do women do this? Why do they do it? You know, he was just shocked and he couldn't believe the way that she had presented herself. And we are to, you know, guard who we are. And uh, women are to not put temptations out there for men because they're there are men that are not able to resist those temptations. Now Joseph, because he was pure of heart, and because, because of that purity of heart, he had love, and he was not going, he loved God, and he was not going to violate his relationship with God just for a momentary pleasure. So in Genesis chapter 39, we see, first of all, I guess a theme that you could say is God's world. To acknowledge that God has a hand in our lives. Because like I said, as we read the scripture there, over and over it said that the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord gave Joseph success. And Joseph recognized the Lord's hand upon him. So, how does God interact with you in your world? And number two, God's standards. Are we willing to live by God's standards? Or do you believe God's way is best? Do you think that it's best to not succumb to the temptations that are out there to become involved in pornography or adultery or any of those uh, particular things? Now, that's just one aspect. I mean, you know, there could be greed or other other things that we can be tempted with. And then thirdly, it says God's plan. Can we trust God even when there's difficulties that emerge? You know, it got uh, Joseph in hot water because he did resist this, because she accused him of something that he never did. He was doing his best not to get involved with her. She was the one that was pursuing him. It was not the other way around. But the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So what temptations are we facing? Maybe it's a temptation to lie or to, like I said, commit adultery, to get involved in um, addictions. Maybe it's uh, drugs or alcohol. You know, there are young people that sometimes get enticed by the peers that they have and they want them to come and party with them. But are we ready to run? Are we ready to be different? Do we believe that God's way is best? And is God's way best all the time? So take courage. Joseph is a good example of it. He had the courage to maintain purity in the midst of it. So this says that it takes great courage to stand for uh, and fight for something, but sometimes it can take even more courage to walk away and leave things behind. So do we have the courage just to say no? Just to say no. The temptation may be so great. Oh, come on, just have a little drink, or do this drug, or, oh, here, here, you know, nobody will ever know that you've, you've done anything. 
you know, that you have committed sexual immorality. So whatever the temptation might be, are we willing just to say no? I think about Daniel as another example. In the first chapter of Daniel, it's telling about the time that Daniel and three of his friends, they were carried away into captivity by the Babylonians. The Babylonians uh, in those days, their empire grew and, and they were taking over the world. And they had come to Jerusalem and into Judah and they were capturing the people. And there were like three waves of uh, the exile that in the first wave they were taking the best of the best. They were taking the leadership those that had skill and ability, <clears throat> excuse me, abilities and talents, and they were carrying them off to Babylon, and they were utilizing their skills, their talents, their wisdom. And Daniel was one of, one of the ones that were carried away into Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And they were being groomed, they were being schooled, they were being taught the ways of the Babylonians. And yet, Daniel and his three friends determined we're not going to become like the Babylonians, not in our heart. And when the king and his, told his officials to feed the exiles certain types of food, Daniel and his friends said, no, we can't eat that. Because the Jews had certain dietary laws. And so Daniel convinced Nebuchadnezzar's official to let them just eat vegetables and water and see, test us for 10 days and see if we're worse than the other people. And in fact, 10 days later, they look better than the rest of them. So every decision that we make, if you look there on the right hand side, it says integrity and character are forged in our resolve to honor God in Every decision, every decision that we make, this is a, an opportunity to forge our integrity and, and to build our character. When we want to honor God, it, no matter what the temptation might be. I think about the old hymn that says, Take Time to Be Holy. And you know, it, some people may look at that song and say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's just old timey and we don't need that anymore. But how true is it that we need to take time to be holy, to be set apart, to speak off with your Lord, to abide in Him always and feed on His Word? This is good words that we need to talk to God. We need to abide with Him. We need to feed on His Word. That's what we've been talking about as we've been discussing discipleship, that we need the Word of God implanted in our lives, that it will keep us in our times when we are facing temptations. Now here's a modern uh, version of holy, holy, holy. You know, when Isaiah had his vision, uh, when King Isaiah died and Isaiah had a vision and he saw God sitting on the throne high and lifted up. And in that vision he saw the seraphim surrounding the throne and they were crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. Well, this is what how this song represents it.
Amen. So, a pure heart is an undivided heart. That our heart, we have settled it in our heart. We have a relationship with God. And that's the most important thing that we, you know, if you have a, re a relationship with someone, you don't want to jeopardize that relationship. If you have, if it's your spouse or a friend, you certainly don't want to jeopardize that relationship and say, well, you know, if I do this, you know, I, I, this might be fun. But if it would jeopardize that relationship in any way, then you don't want to do it. So you have to purpose in your heart that you are not going to compromise. And also, a pure heart is a clean, uh, a clean heart. It's clear, it's clean, it's pure, it's unalloyed, it's single. And as it says in Psalm 12, 6, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. So you think about that, as silver is purified, you put it in the fire, and you the dross, the, the impurities come to the top and you scoop that out. And you do this seven times and then by that time all the impurities have been removed. And that's what the Word of God, the words of the Lord, they purify us. So when we ingest the Word of God, when we meditate on it, when we, you know, I think the word uh, meditate means to mutter, or it's like a cow that would chew its cud. As we meditate or we chew the cud and we just take the Word of God and we ingest it and we think about it and we meditate on it, it purifies our heart and we uh, know that we want to do those things that would please God but would also be pleasing to other people as well. In Psalm 24, it asks some very good questions, but we can put it in this format because in verse 3, that's where the questions are asked. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? These are good questions. Who can stand in the presence of the Lord? Who can go to where God is? And the answer is verse 4, He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. So we have to have clean hands and a pure heart to stand in the presence of the Lord. Otherwise, we're going to stand before him guilty. We are going to feel condemned. If we do not have clean hands and a pure heart, we stand before God and we will all stand before the Lord at one point or another. And when we do... How are we going to feel in His presence before a holy and a righteous God? And it's only those who have a clean hand and a pure heart. And verse 5 says, He will receive blessing from the Lord. If we want to be blessed, and this is what we've been talking about with the Beatitudes, to be blessed from the Lord, and we said that this is when we meditate on the Word of God that that's what gives us abundant life. And the abundant life is found in the Beatitudes that Jesus is teaching us about. This is where we receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God His Savior. We are vindicated by what Jesus Christ did for us. So this key verse, he who has, a clean, who has clean hands and a pure heart, this is the one, these are the ones that can stand before a holy and a righteous God. In Revelation chapter 19, this is the picture of the fulfillment of what God is wanting to happen when it's all said and done, when we come to the end of this age, what is God's goal? What is, what is He looking for? Well, in Revelation chapter 9, it is talking about that there is going to be a marriage 
there is going to be a wedding. And we're talking about the marriage of the Lamb. The marriage of the Lamb. The Lamb is Jesus Christ. And His wife has made herself ready. His wife is, or His bride, is the church. That He's looking for the church to be without spot or without blemish. Think about the marriages or the weddings that you've gone to. And the groom, when he sees that bride as she enters into, whether it's the church or wherever they're having the, the, the wedding, when he sees his bride come down the aisle, and it's like he catches his breath at her beauty and the fact that he has found someone to unite himself with in this life, to be partnered with. And that's the way that the Lord looks upon us. He sees us as something that is beautiful. She's arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The righteous acts of the saints. And he says, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So there's going to be a wedding and as Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, 27, Jesus will present the bride, the church, to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. He is looking forward to that day when he will be united with the body of Christ, that they will be joined together in an intimate relationship for all of eternity. Wouldn't that be, isn't that just the greatest thing that you could think about? That we would be entered into the presence of the Lord. I heard a story of this uh, man who's in ministry and he has a prophetic gift. And uh, he saw a man in the congregation and and uh, God spoke to him about this man, and this man had lost his wife. And the Lord revealed to him, he saw the wife that he had lost in heaven, and that she was hand in hand with Jesus, and that she was happy and she was full of joy, that she was walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was such a joy in her heart. And she wanted her husband back here on earth. She wanted him to be happy. She wanted him to be full of joy. She wanted him to have a full life. She did not want him to be miserable because she was not there with him. Because she was in the presence of joy. And so I think about that. When we are united with Jesus Christ, what will that be like? And so, here in Revelation chapter 19, verse 6, John hears a sound, and it's like many waters and thunderings, and it says, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Isn't that wonderful? And it's talking about his bride and how she'll be dressed in fine linen. The fine linen represents her righteousness. The fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is wonderful. Blessed are those who are invited to this marriage supper of the Lamb. That she has been set apart from this world. And that... Jesus' bride has made herself ready. That's what we are to do is to make sure that we've been made ready for His coming. And in Zechariah 14, 9, it says, The Lord will be king over all the earth, and on that day there will be one Lord, and His name the only name. Isn't that great? The name of Jesus Christ that now is used as a curse word a lot of times but that day is going to be the only name. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, with the great sound of a trumpet. 
And so it says in verse 9, right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. These are the true words that come from God. So my heart's only desire is to be holy, to be set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be holy, set apart for my master, ready to do your will. And here's an old song. Uh, it's got a country and western flavor to it, but I just want you, it, this was by Kylie Rowland, and this is being sung by the Inspirations, if any of you are Southern Gospel uh, fans back in the day. Uh, but just listen to the words of this song by Kylie Rowland. So you get a, a good flavor of, of the wedding of the Lamb that is coming. Are we ready? Heavenly Father, we just want to thank and praise you and just lift up our voices and just give you praise. Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Thank you, Lord, that you're coming again. Thank you that you have a wedding supper prepared and that you have extended the invitation. You've invited us to come and to be a part of this. So, Father, we just praise you and we thank you, and we want to be ready for that day. We want to keep our hearts pure before you because we want to be part of the celebration. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace that follows us all the days of our life. We give you the thanks and praise for everything that you are in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.